Greetings from Columbia Business School Executive Education. My name is Scott Gardner, and I'm here today with David Rogers for the Leading Digital Transformation That Matters webinar. Before I introduce David, I'd like to just go over a few quick logistics. As you'll see on your screen right now, a recording of this webinar will be emailed to you. If you'd like to tweet about this webinar, please do so at hashtag CBS Exec Ed. And finally, most importantly, please submit those questions to the Q&A box and I'll get to as many of those as possible in the last 10 minutes. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce David Rogers. He is a globally recognized leader on digital strategy and leadership, known for his pioneering work on digital transformation. At Columbia Business School Executive Education, he teaches global executives about digital transformation and digital business leadership. His most recent research focuses on new business models, asymmetric competition, customer data sharing, and digital transformation in legacy organizations. Rogers has advised executives and delivered workshops on digital transformation in companies such as Citi, Toyota, GE, Google, and dozens of others. He is the author of four books, including his best-selling, The Digital Transformation Playbook, Rethink Your Business for the Digital Age, published in 11 languages. He is the faculty director of two upcoming Columbia Business School executive education programs. The first is an intense three-hour session accelerating digital transformation for the COVID era, which is taking place tomorrow, March 9th. And the second is a five-day deep dive called Leading Digital Transformation, Accelerate Change for Business Impact, which will be taking place this April. David, it's great to see you. Great to be with you today. And Thanks, I, Scott. It's a pleasure to, to join you as always. I wish we were in person. I miss seeing you, but I will, uh, I'm going to turn off my camera now and I'll rejoin you for the Q&A in the last 10 minutes. Have a good session. Terrific. Thanks, Scott. Uh, great to be with you. Thanks so many folks for joining us. Uh, I see we have uh, ticking up already close to 700 participants logged in out of our 2000 plus who registered. So clearly people are interested in the topic of digital transformation. Let me share a little bit about how I come to this topic. Uh, just kind of picking up on what Scott said. So I spend obviously part of my time teaching, but my teaching at Columbia for the last decade has really been focused on teaching executives. So uh, really going into the classroom with folks who have a lot of experience, uh, deep knowledge, these are mid-career executives, really taking on new leadership roles and, and bringing very serious and important questions into the, the classroom, so to speak, whether it's in person or virtual or hybrid as many of my programs have been. Uh, when I'm not teaching, I try to spend uh, uh, obviously a lot of my time uh, writing. So uh, right, I've written four books so far and doing research really on questions that I'm hearing from those executives and hearing from uh, all kinds of organizations around the world. So these are very practical research topics like how are customers using their mobile devices while they are in physical retail stores and what can we learn about the sort of omni-channel future of commerce. Uh, looking at uh, uh, trends and attitudes and drivers of customer uh, decision around data sharing. What makes customers, your customers, more or less willing to share data? Business models for the Internet of Things, uh, a variety of topics. But again, these kind of questions that I see companies grappling with every day. And I try to spend the balance of my time uh, following the advice of my friend uh, Steve Blank, who always uh, uh, exhorts entrepreneurs to get out of the building uh, and if you're an entrepreneur, that means don't stay in your, you know, your, your, your room with your post-its and your, and your uh, co-founders uh, dreaming up ideas of how you're going to build a business and get out and talk to customers. Uh, and if you're an academic or a writer or a thinker, that means spend as much time as you can off campus getting out there in the trenches. So that's really what I try to spend as much time year-round doing is spending time speaking with, advising, consulting to companies and very intentionally across a wide range of industries, different geographies and different sort of size and scale of businesses in order to see what are the common problems uh, that are emerging? What are the common challenges that organizations as different as a Google or an HP versus a luxury brand like a Cartier or an automaker like Toyota or a financial services business? What are these very different organizations all grappling with? And can we develop frameworks, tools, uh, strategic approaches to these issues that are useful across these very different kinds of organizations. 
Uh, and what I have seen for the last several years is my focus has been on uh, the intersection of digital technology and organizations and business and value creation is this uh, emerging topic uh, of digital transformation uh, coming sort of from all corners. Uh, I actually wrote the first book on the topic. It's been followed by many other uh, books, but my publisher, uh, Columbia, was, was really happy with the response and, and immediately saw that this was not sort of limited to any, well, for one thing, geography. We already have 11 languages uh, in publication and two more on the way uh, this year. Um, but the question is, what do we actually mean by digital transformation? So I, I can write a book on this, I can talk to audiences around the world. What I typically find is everyone is thinking about this, but it has a very hard time pinning it down and defining. So let me offer my definition, which is quite simple, but a, a sort of an important starting point. To me, digital transformation is simply this challenge. How does a business that started before the internet adapt and evolve so that it can continue to grow in the digital age, the digital economy that every business is facing today? Um, now, if we take that as our definition of what we're seeking to understand, I wanna underline one particular thing right off the bat. There is a real difference here between the question of how do I build the next you know, Uber or the next Airbnb or Shopify or Jumi or whatever it is. Um, you know, how do I create a new digital business from scratch, looking at uh, emerging and shifting needs in the marketplace. We've certainly seen a lot of changes in marketplace needs in the last 12 months, for example. Looking at emerging technologies, identifying at some kind of intersection where there's a new opportunity to create value that uh, has some competitive sort of white space and looking for that holy grail of every startup, uh, the repeatable, scalable, profitable business model, right? That is one question. That is not the question. It's not the same question. It's related, but it is not the same question as digital transformation, which is how do you take an existing organization, think of the New York Times, a business that's been around for decades, perhaps a century or more, but an organization that already has customers, employees, a business model, products and services, a brand reputation, a distribution channels, partners, all of these things are already in place, financial capital, intellectual property. Now, many of these things can be and should be assets, right? That can be leveraged by the existing organization. And yet in many, many cases, what we see is all of these existing, uh, uh, you know, everything from the organizational chart to the financial models to the current revenue streams uh, of these legacy, if you will, or incumbent organizations, these can all become forces of inertia that reduce the agility of these organizations, prevent them from taking aggressive change and really hold them back from adapting and seizing the opportunities that are available to them and responding to the emerging and rapidly changing threats and challenges uh, in the landscape around them. So this is really what we need to focus on. And, and we can see companies by now, we do have businesses which we can point to that have made significant uh, change as part of a digital transformation that has really driven a significant business impact. So the New York Times is actually a great example. Um, and really what we can see now is, is that the business, uh, the change that was really necessary for the Times was not so much about sort of uh, uh, adding new technology so much as it was about changing their business model. Uh, and that was kind of the real key insight for the Times leadership was to recognize that what they most needed to do was to transform from a business that was driven on advertising revenue with a bit of supplemental revenue from uh, subscriptions to become a business that was primarily a reader, subscriber, subscription, direct-to-consumer business model. That is where most of the revenue comes from. And then there's some additional revenue streams from advertising. Of course, the reason why that has to be done has to do with the whole economics around content uh, and publishing in the digital economy. But fundamentally, that is the key change that had to happen for the Times. And to make that change happen, they had to change everything about the organization the way the organization operates, the what meetings they have on Monday morning, how teams are formed, how teams are measured, what, how they define the work that they're doing, all of these things had to change. And this is why this is really truly what we, what we mean by a transformation, not just sort of a, a, a project or an adding uh, some you know, new technology or software to, to your business. Now, 
one of the things that I hear most uh, these days is uh, why are digital transformations failing? And so we see lots of companies at this point have attempted or invested or talked about pursuing some kind of a digital transformation. And time has gone by and the surveys are now coming out from the big consulting firms, of course, they, they, they are looking to drum up business. But uh, the results of these surveys, I think, point to a stark reality, which is that uh, you know, typically they all find 70% in some markets, maybe even higher, of respondents, companies who say they have been pursuing a digital transformation, that they report they are not satisfied with the results, that they are not seeing the impact and results that they expected. So why is this happening? And to delve into this a little bit, I want to first actually turn a little bit back to the New York Times, uh, because this is a, a company we often, I, we can easily point to as a success factor, uh, as an example. I want to show that it wasn't necessarily so, or it wasn't so uh, for quite a while. Now, their transformation began actually back in January 19th, 1996. That was the day the New York Times embarked on their digital journey. And with much fanfare, they launched, this is the team in the Hippodrome building, uh, launching the web page, the first uh, uh, newspaper on the World Wide Web, in the first edition of the New York Times. Uh, and there was much excitement and, and leadership support. This is the publisher at the Times, uh, Arthur Ock Salzberger Jr., really announcing that this was a top priority. Uh, but I want you to pay attention to how he defined the challenge. He said, the internet, that's fine. Hell, if someone would be kind enough to invent the technology, I would beam the New York Times directly into your cerebral cortex, into your brain, right? Uh, and this, I would point out, while it might on its surface look like enthusiasm and a leadership mandate, uh, actually turned out to be a complete misunderstanding of what the challenge was, uh, what the opportunity was, and led the Times for years down a path we have seen in many other industries of simply trying to digitize their existing company. Take the same product and okay, the internet, this is just another way to deliver the exact same newspaper to the same people. It's another delivery mechanism. It's another distribution channel. Depending on your industry, it's another uh, sales channel or it's another marketing channel or it's just a means for sort of uh, adding cost efficiencies and automation to your existing business model. Um, and what ultimately happened was, of course, that was a complete failure because the real problem for the New York Times in the digital era was not how do we get the, the information to people more quickly. Uh, as, we, as we saw, it was really about how do we actually sustain the enterprise as the economics completely transform around us. And so they frankly flailed and uh, uh, did all sorts of high profile digital projects with very disappointing results and lack of real sort of financial impact uh, and great organizational divisions and resistance within this legacy company of what was going on went on for years and years until finally in 2014, there was this uh, incredible report that was uh, uh, commissioned by the top leadership, conducted by a multi-level team, including the, the man who went on to become the next publisher, who's sort of the heir apparent. And they really talked to everyone throughout the organization and really produce this just scathing report about the, lo the level of dysfunction, uh, resistance, inertia, the lack of meaningful change, the misunderstanding of what the problem was for the New York Times. This was actually leaked to uh, uh, the press, the public, and had a huge impact on the whole industry as people realized how serious the challenges were. But a few years after that, 2018, we were already seeing dramatic changes. Uh, suddenly, the company was reporting a profit, digital subscribers, were the new growth engine, real revenue is coming out of digital transformation because the company had finally gotten serious about what the problem really was and the level of organizational change it would take uh, to achieve that. So one of the most common questions that I get and, and got from many of you in the advanced uh, uh, Q&A opportunity when you registered, you asked, you have a question for Professor Rogers, is you know, what are the biggest reasons why digital transformations fail? So I, I wanna briefly share the thoughts that I've, I've been developing in my recent research and in my uh, next book, which I'm currently writing. So the first challenge I see is I see companies with a very generic conception of what it means to become digital. They say, well, our competitors hired a chief digital officer, so we're gonna do that. Or, well, you know, we, we heard about you know, uh, Blockbuster and, and Kodak, so we, we don't wanna be like that, so we're gonna do something digital. Uh, there's really not a compelling case for why this matters to your particular industry, your particular business, and what the opportunities are. 
Uh, the second is that these efforts are disconnected very uh, uh, sadly from business strategy. Um, uh, most commonly, it's seen as an IT uh, implementation project, sort of a costly capital investment. Um, in other cases, it's sort of seen as kind of a skunk's work. So let's stick it off uh, a special lab and there's gonna be a team that's gonna sort of figure this out uh, for us. But it's not really linked to the key sort of central uh, strategy uh, process and decision-making of the organization. Uh, a third cause of failure is a focus on uh, seeking out benchmarks, looking for best practices, give me a digital maturity model and show where I am compared with everyone else, uh, and attempting to deal with the very real uncertainties around uh, success in the digital era with ever more detailed planning and business case uh, preparation and analysis. Uh, the fourth uh, uh, cause of failure I see is that companies are trying to uh, drive real digital change, and yet all of their initiatives uh, that they're pursuing, all of their new digital growth ventures, have to be managed within the existing, if you call it a business as usual, BAU, uh, governance model, process, management model of the organization. The fifth uh, cause of failure is that uh, we see companies where digital innovations are able to happen in pockets. There are pilots and there are small teams and there are individuals who are entrepreneurial and, and have great ideas. And so you see pockets of real interesting innovation and opportunities, but none of them ever seem to scale. You're not able to take these initial seeds and actually leverage the whole organization, integrate them within the rest of the business and get them to a scale where you actually have impact at a size that matters to an established organization rather than simply a new startup. Uh, and the last, the sixth reason I see uh, the digital transformations fail is I see companies who are really, they're trying to change their business, but they're trying to do so with the same culture and the same capabilities that they had going in uh, and not realizing how critical that is to any real kind of digital transformation. Uh, now, I have another slide where I sort of talk through the, the success factors, but basically you'll see it's, it's the reverse of each of these. And we can talk a little more in the Q&A about the importance of unique and compelling reason why, making sure and how you make sure that digital is growth focused and designed around specific strategic opportunities, that the focus is not on benchmarks, it is on experimentation and rapid learning, that you develop parallel management models for pursuing parallel paths to growth, uh, focus particularly keenly on how do you scale and integrate uh, new ideas and new innovations within the large organization, and you focus throughout on changing culture and growing capabilities. So a little bit about culture. Uh, this is a word I used to sort of steer away from because I see it's used in such a sort of vague and fluffy and flowery language uh, as kind of a way of sort of saying, well, it's all a matter of culture, and then never really defining what that means, and it sort of becomes a a, a way of saying this problem is very difficult and we're not sure how to deal with it. Um, I believe culture is critical to organizational change, uh, but we have to understand that culture is simply a matter of behavior. Right? This is not some vague term like excellence or, or, or uh, you know, um, how are we honest in integrity. Uh, this is about how are people specifically behaving in our organization. So I always love the definition of of corporate culture or organizational culture uh, from Herb Kelleher, the co-founder of Southwest Airlines, said culture is what people do when no one is looking. And what I've learned in really studying examples of organizations that are able to drive culture and, and behavioral change at scale is the way you change behavior, you have to actually address two things, which I describe as a sort of a yin and a yang because each one is interdependent upon the other. You've got to change your processes, right? If you want people to behave differently, uh, right away I ask, you know, what are you, what are you incentivizing them to do? What are you measuring them for doing? How are you allocating resources? You know, how are teams formed? How are people's time uh, divided up? Uh, what are the processes in place where things get approved? How is budgeting done? If you want to change people's behavior, you have to look at these formal mechanisms, if you will, which is what process is. But process alone will not get you to a, a true transformation. You also have to look at the informal uh, uh, shapers of behavior. 
How do people behave when no one's looking, when it's not being measured outside of the KPIs? What are the other behaviors and sort of instincts and by default ways that we make decisions and take actions and the pace at which we move and things like that? And these things fall in this, this uh, uh, area, which I call culture, which is more uh, shaped not so much by sort of rules and parameters, but by stories and symbols, uh, which leaders have a real important role in sort of defining. And in a sense, they, they show the meaning behind why we are making these changes in our process and operating model and so forth. And when, when the people inside your organization see not only what they're asked to do, but why it matters, that is where I see organizations that really have powerful alignment and can change the way behavior uh, takes place inside. So just as two contrasting examples, and to show this is not just something about sort of new companies or digital companies or others, um, I see great examples of this both in Amazon, but also in companies like Ford Motors. Uh, and really what it calls on leaders to do is first to define what is the culture change you see? Wh where do we need to go? What are the behaviors we need to uh, increase, enhance, uh, become more of uh, in our organization? And then look for how do we not just articulate that very clearly, but how do we actually reinforce that with our, our process? So Amazon is famous for its 14 leadership principles. These are not just a bunch of fuzzy words that feel good when you say them. These, you can see them on their website, you know, customer obsession, ownership, uh, invent and simplify. Each of them then is spelled out, right? There's a paragraph explaining what does this really look like in action? And not only is this sort of written somewhere, if you talk to people who work in Amazon, the leadership principles are something that are referred to constantly. When you are hired, you asked about them. When you go into a meeting, people touch back on them. You're thinking about a topic and people say, well, how does this relate to, and they'll point to one of the 14 uh, leadership principles and say, well, how does this, you know, what would that suggest uh, about this decision we're trying to make right now? So they're really embedded in the way people behave. Ford has, uh, you know, talking with their recent chief transformation officer, uh, it was fascinating to hear about the process they went to define five sort of cultural principles. They call their Ford's rules of the road. Uh, respecting knowledge over hierarchy, building trust, express yourself, shape our future, solve the problem. Each of these are not just slogans. They actually talk about and spell out what does that really mean? What is the behavior we're looking for? Solve the problem is all about being proactive. When you identify something is not working inside Ford, when there's some kind of friction, when, when something isn't getting done that should be getting done or is harder to do than it should be, you cannot walk away and say, well, it's not my job. If you spot that, you have to take ownership. You have to take action and say, we are going to address this right now, right here until it is done. So they really spell out what each of these rules means. And then critically in both organizations, they put in place uh, processes, rules, procedures that reinforce and support and enable these. So Amazon, these are things like their whole design of their modular teams, what they call their two pizza teams and how they set them up to be autonomous and give them multifunctional skill sets and, and set up you know, very specific, the, the APIs and modular data within the organization are all designed to allow these small teams to embody specific leadership principles like ownership of the problem that they're working on. Similarly, Ford, uh, Marcy Cleavorn told me the story, just one of the sort of actual processes they put in place. This was to support that idea of solve the problem well, she created a process called office hours, where once a week there's a meeting where herself and a, a, a small leadership team of other people she had picked to bring into the room with her with different roles within, uh, within Ford, things like HR, things like legal and, and otherwise, would be in a room and any project manager could come in uh, at any time and say, hey, here's what I'm working on. Here's the roadblock I'm running into. Here's the, 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 the uh, administrative or bureaucratic hurdle I, I, I'm, 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 that's slowing down my my, my digital initiative. And the people in the room had to solve the problem right then. Uh, the, the, you, no one was turned away. You could not say, oh, that's tough. We'll think about it. They had to come up with a, a way right then to, to uh, remove the roadblock and get this team uh, you know, back on a path to making progress. So um, I, I want to take some questions about all of this. But uh, before we do, just a few words about uh, uh, the upcoming. So I have this program, The Leading Digital Transformation, uh, which is a five-day program we're, we're going to be launching next month. Uh, the key themes are going to be looking at how leaders drive iterative change. This is not a waterfall process. It's not about doing A for six months and then B and then C. But how do you read the, really build an iterative cycle uh, uh, of steps that is going to drive deeper and deeper into your organization and making more lasting change. 
it's, is about strategy uh, mindset. We'll look at some of the key principles from uh, the Digital Transformation Playbook, which is really a, uh, a strategic uh, framework for understanding how do you think differently about customer strategy, about competitive strategy, about data innovation and your value proposition in the digital era. Uh, and there'll be a strong focus on organizational behavior and helping you to sort of define what are the changes in culture you want to see or need to see in your organization and how can you actually align process in a way to reinforce that. Uh, and I look forward to having, uh, I always have at least one guest speaker in each of these programs where I bring in someone who's in a leadership position uh, in one of these kinds of companies where they really are going through this process and have been for some time and have their own sort of scars uh, to show for uh, the changes that they have uh, been a part of. Um, so I just want to end with, with one last point before we go to questions, which is uh, another great question we heard in advance of today, which was, uh, the role of leaders and how is it different in the digital era? And this is something I've been thinking a lot about recently. And, and to me, really, it's very important as you think about digital transformation to understand uh, the role of leadership is it has to be different in the digital era. It's not the old top-down command and control. The way you get the company to change is by ordering people to do so and telling them you've got to get more digital and here's what you've got to do. Um, that does not work with large complex organizations, uh, incumbent organizations. What you really need to do, the most important three jobs for any leader as I see them are first, you have to define and communicate where you're going and why. Right? Where is the organization going? What is the digital future? Why does this matter to your organization? Uh, and second, what you're gonna see is that people are gonna come out of the woodwork. You're gonna have people step forward. Some people are gonna hold back but you're going to immediately, the more you can articulate where you're going and why, people are going to step forward and want to be a part of this in change in the organization. And then what you have to do is not tell people what to do. You have to enable those who are ready to take action because this has to be bottom up just as much as it's top down. So you have to empower these people, remove obstacles, let those who want to move the organization in that direction actually uh, move as far and as fast as possible. Uh, and lastly, you have to embody this vision of where you're going in your own decisions as a leader. So that is not you know, coming up with the digital strategies and innovations and new product ideas. Uh, really what this most often is about is critical decisions about allocating resources and people. Uh, who do you allocate where? Or who do you elevate? Who do you put in charge of what? Uh, who do you hire to bring in the right people? These are kinds of questions that are really uh, sit in the, the domain of top leadership or leadership within a division or unit. Um, and though all those decisions that you're making have to reflect uh, the same vision that you are articulating of where you're going and why. All right, so let's take uh, some of your questions and uh, I'll welcome back uh, Scott who can uh, join me for the q and I also have a QR code up here, which will I'll pop up on my background. If anyone wants to reach out to uh, follow me or connect with me on LinkedIn. Thank you, David. Thank you. A lot of good questions come in. So I'm going to ask for I'll ask two favors. One is that I think let's go a few minutes longer because otherwise we'll absolutely I want to maybe like maybe maybe five, you know, let's let's get some of these in. And I'll just ask you for your what we call the reader's digest answer to these questions because I want to get to as many as possible. Sound good? Great. Absolutely. Okay, great. I'll try to be so succinct. the first one comes from Parag, and he's you know, asking that if you take the definition of digital transformation, your definition. Do companies that started after the an advent of the internet, do they not require digital transformation? Would they not derive benefit? Uh, they are not, I would argue they are not pursuing a digital transformation. Now, many of the ideas that I talk about in uh, this, in my books and my classes, these are all applicable to them. All the strategic principles uh, are, are applicable. Um, you know, but it is, you're, you're coming from a different starting point. You know, I don't believe we benefit by using the word digital transformation uh, for, for everything. I think, for example, when I talked about the three principles of leadership, that applies if you're a company that just started, you know, uh, this year. If you look at thinking about competitive strategy, and we talk about platform business models, for example, and understanding how they change competition, that absolutely is essential for you to understand whether you're a new business building a platform or a legacy responding to it. Uh, but, but when I talk about organizational change and how do you drive uh, organizational change, and that's really what digital transformation is all about, 
it really is a, an additional layer of all these other challenges that come on. And that's what I discovered is that I would meet businesses who got the general idea. Top leaders said, yes, we see the landscape has changed and we understand about these new digital players. And they would kind of get the strategic concepts. And yet they would say, I'm frustrated. I've been talking about this uh, and, 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 and I hired people and I put budget behind it and I said, we're gonna transform and it's been 18 months and I don't see anything happening. And like we're spinning our wheels and nothing's getting done. Uh, and that really uh, showed me the importance that you have to be able to change your strategic mindset. But if you're an existing organization, you have to couple that with addressing these questions for organizational change, organizational behavior. Right, perfect, thank you. So one thing that I know we all have on the top of mind, and this question came in, how will the pandemic impact digital transformation? <laughs> so funny thing, you should ask that. We're gonna be talking about that specifically tomorrow in the three hour program, the executive access program, which is about ex uh, accelerating digital transformation uh, in, the, in the COVID or post COVID era. I actually just did some research on this uh, uh, study. I, I did in partnership with HCL, the technology services company. And it was really fascinating. It was a global study looking at um, really what has been the change in terms of digital transformation as an agenda item and it's in, and in terms of the needs and the problems and challenges companies have faced are facing in the last 12 months obviously it's been a, a tremendous focus in terms of how practically every industry has been uh, impacted by the pandemic although different industries different business models impacted in very different ways some of them part of the problem is you know your dominoes the problem is your your demand is growing too fast how do you keep up with it you know how do you keep your employees safe while you're dealing with these surging orders uh, other companies, obviously, very different kind of problems. Some companies like Disney, you're in the middle. You've got a new business model that's through the roof, and your old business, which is the majority of your revenue, is completely you know, crashed, and you're wondering how soon can we reopen the theme parks. So we're going to be talking about that, but um, the short answer is, I, I was asked about this recently, it's really digital transformation now, post-2020, post, you know, is no longer a question of if. It's no longer, well, should we do this? Does it really matter to our industry, to our company? Uh, no one is asking that anymore. It's just a question of how fast. How fast can we actually make this change happen realistically in our organization? Right. That's a great point. It's, not, it's no longer the question of if, you know, yeah. it's when and how fast. Okay, great. I'm gonna combine a couple questions because they're following okay. the theme. It's something you mentioned right in the beginning about budgets. So the question came in double from uh, Yanid and Tufik. And the question was, and it's like a three-part question, how do companies transform digitally with limited budgets and how costly is this in general? And how do you benchmark then the ROI? Great. So uh, let me start with uh, what does it take and then how do you deal if you don't have and then how do you ROI? So how much time does this take and how much money does it take? This is a common question I'll get from, from like a CEO. It's like, okay, okay, I understand this, this matters. We've got we to get this on the agenda. But is this like a two-year project or a three-year project? And is this like a $50 million project or a $100 million project? Uh, and to me, those are really the wrong questions to ask. Um, so first of all, it is not a project. It does not have a start and an end date. It is an ongoing process. You are not ever going to be done. Uh, if you look at, for example, Satya Nadella, after he came in as the CEO of Microsoft, uh, he was asked this about really sort of cultural transformation he was talking about. Now, he was also shifting their whole business model towards software as a service, towards cloud computing, moving away from the legacy businesses that had all this kind of weight within the company and political clout and are still there, but what he saw were not really the future growth. Um, but he talked about this and he said, look, it's it's maybe it's kind of an Eastern uh, philosophy response, but but uh, people say, when is this going to be done? This this transformation you're leading. He said, it's it's never done. Uh, we want to keep uh, pushing ourselves to uh, go further and further and do this more. So so don't think of it as an end date. That also leads to a lot of uh, of really applying the wrong management models. You've got to move away from this kind of business case, detailed analysis, waterfall projects, uh, implementation A, B, C, D, and you're done. There's way too much uncertainty that's way too slow. It's also very costly. It's also very high risk. Uh, and so the approach you really need to take is much more iterative. It is drawing on uh, management models such as agile software development, design thinking, lean startup, uh, product management, which are all about 
uh, identifying opportunities and iteratively working your way towards them. And one of the things that I talk about in my own research, in my work, and my frameworks is about understanding the sort of uh, what I call the inverse curve of uncertainty. And as you move from an opportunity which has more uncertainty to less uncertainty, that's really your goal. And so you're starting a new digital initiative. You've got a lot of questions. People say, how much should I spend? My short answer is as little as possible at the start, right? You want to spend as little as possible at the beginning. And you want to focus all of those investments on learning, on validating, testing, seeing what are the right problems? What are the opportunities? These strategies we're thinking about, do they actually resonate with customers? And then only as you validate their hypotheses, only as you learn more about the market opportunities, are you going to then start staging up. And at a certain point, you've got to be ready to invest, but not on some idea that your financial analysts or your, your strategy consultants have developed a business case for six months in their room. It's got to be because you've got customers who are using the product and demanding more because you started it right out the gate and you built something in the first 90 days and you've got it in their hands. I love that. And I think that would also help with the change in the culture, right? You know, I mean, that's a that's a better process for changing culture. You don't, you don't take a global company and, for example, as I've seen business cases completely misguided say, well, we need to become more agile. We think agile software development is important. So as of the following date, everybody in our company is now being shifted to a totally different management model and, and, and you all have your new job descriptions. That is the antithesis of what agile is all about. It's all about iterative change. So the organizational changes I showed in that, that sort of circle slide near the end, it's about taking an iterative approach to driving the change in your organization. And that's how you build momentum and actually do things at scale in a big company. So just, uh, I'm going to do two more questions. The first one from Daniel is, so who in the organization should be in charge of digital transformation? Uh, so there's not sort of a, a, a universal answer to that. I mean, I sort of, as a shorthand, use the term chief digital officer. Uh, the people who I see in that role may or may not be have that title. Uh, that really doesn't matter so much. But what I do see is that organizations uh, uh, of you know, a decent size really benefit from having someone who is in charge of not controlling it's not that they are bossing everyone around and they have a giant budget. They probably actually should have a relatively small budget and a relatively small set of people directly under them. People say, how much do we spend on digital transformation? How big is the budget? If you're doing this big, if you're a Walmart, a New York Times, if you're a company who's like going all in on this and, and, and you, your strategies are clear, you don't have some giant separate digital budget by some chief digital officer. It's the actual operating budgets. It's the HR budget of your company. It's the IT budget of your company. It's the p &Ls of each of your business units. It's reallocating and how you're using your existing budgets. Uh, so, so the role of the chief digital officer, whether you call them that or not, is really about oversight and alignment. Should be someone who is has the absolute support and backing of the CEO, has a direct relationship with them. Uh, and their job is really to, again, help with the top leadership team to define the, the unique compelling why, why digital matters to our particular organization, define those key problem opportunity areas that are, that are uh, really what you should be focusing your investments on, uh, helping to, to guide these organizational changes, like setting up, standing up different management models and creating different structures where you can go after different projects in, in not following your BAU or sort of traditional process, uh, and being the sort of enabler of change and oversight so that you can see you have some visibility into the fact that this business unit here or this geographic unit over there is doing this. And well, that should be scaled up. We shouldn't be reinventing the wheel. So it's, it's much more about alignment, oversight, and viewpoint. Uh, it's a very strategic role. It's also a very political role. And so finding the right person, sometimes that might be someone who was, say, a CIO. It is not at all the classic traditional CIO role, but I see all kinds of people with that background. Sometimes it is a chief marketing officer role. Sometimes it's someone who is a business unit head who was previously heading a business unit or a geographic unit. Uh, it could be an outsider. Uh, I, I think there's certain attributes. It's great to have people who have real experience working in a very entrepreneurial fashion, whether they've been in venture capital, been a, an entrepreneur themselves, uh, somebody who's used these kind of lean iterative innovation methods, uh, but you've got to have someone who also understands how things work within a large uh, complex organization and kind of get that sort of culture. Process and culture, process and culture, the balance, right? All right, one final question. I always ask this, what next? 
What next? What, what, how can we keep this energy going from today's webinar? What's next? So uh, I would say next steps, we have two things coming up. One, again, we've got the three hour executive access program uh, looking on accelerating digital transformation for the post COVID era. Uh, that's coming up tomorrow. And I think you'll be getting some in the follow up email with today's video, there'll, there'll be links and some information on that. Um, and then in April, we're going to be launching uh, the leading digital transformation program. Um, and I encourage you, particularly if you are someone who is, you know, currently actually grappling with this. This is something you're trying to deal with in your in your uh, own organization right now. You know, that program is going to be looking in the trenches at all these topics we talked about today, looking at driving real change. There's going to be, you know, advanced reading and assignments for you to work on before the week even starts. So if you are ready to actually, if you are currently working on or are, are uh, embarking on this kind of effort yourself, this is going to be designed as a way for you to really accelerate uh, your own steps, put together the, the sort of roadmap for where you're going next, defining the changes in your organization, and not just seeing some very specific frameworks and tools, uh, gaining some tools to sort of do that, but also getting to uh, learn from each other. And that's a big uh, part of the whole approach to executive education at Columbia that we firmly believe in and I'm a huge champion of is really facilitating that cross learning of the different people in the program from their own leadership experiences in different kinds of organizations. Thank you very much, David. A lot of great information today. Excited for the programs coming up. I'll see you tomorrow night. Uh, I'll be with you tomorrow night. So Thank you very much. And on behalf of Columbia Business School Executive Education, David Rogers, myself, thank you so much for joining us. We wish you a safe and happy day. Thanks, David. Thanks, Scott. Take care. Thanks, everyone.